Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Well, thanks for coming out tonight um, to this event. So uh, this is going to be the kickoff for our Pride Month. So stay tuned for more events coming up over the next couple of weeks. Um, so this event was made possible through the very generous donation from the Sager Foundation, as well as the uh, tremendous support we've received from the Film and Media Department. Thank you. <laughs> So just a little bit about our speaker tonight. Catherine Cross is a PhD student in sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City who specializes in the study of gender online, especially online harassment. In addition to being a weekly columnist at Feministing, she is a cultural critic who has written extensively about the virtual world and video gaming in particular. She's a frequent contributor to Bitch Magazine, a weekly contributor at Gamma Sutra, and her work has appeared in Polygon, Paste Magazine, Boing Boing's Offworld, and RH Reality Check. She is a sought-after expert in the study of online harassment in gaming culture, who has been interviewed in publications like The Nation, Vice, and Le Monde. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Cross. Thank you so much for being here tonight, everyone, and thank you uh, for that fulsome welcome, and of course, my personal thanks to the Film and Media Department here at Swarthmore for hosting me, and for Claudia, whose wonderful idea it was to get me out here. And also, thank you for coming out on this rainy night. I really do appreciate it. So, what I'll be talking about tonight is based on two academic papers of mine, which I will be excerpting from and extemporizing from as well. The first of these is indeed that which gave its title to tonight's event, Ethics for Cyborgs, the paper that I wrote for loading the uh, Canadian Game Studies Association journal looked at the causes and structure of online harassment. Thank you so very much. <laughs> There's nothing like a good cup of tea on a rainy night. I don't know about this. <laughs> oh, tish, tish. So uh, Ethics for Cyborgs was written for loading the Journal of the Canadian Game Studies Association, and it looks at the causes and structures of online harassment in the gaming space. But the analysis that I performed, the research, and the conclusions which I drew can apply beyond gaming as well to the entire internet. So without further ado, how do we make sense of comments like this left online? Quote, you're a Bolshevik feminist Jewess that hates white people and you expect to be taken seriously when you're critiquing video games? Fucking oven dodger. Or, quote, you probably are a pedophile. 90% of you freaks are, after all. Anyways, I hope someone kills you so you don't have to suffer anymore. End quote. A culture of prejudice and harassment that has long prevailed in the physical world has now made a firm outpost of the virtual. But it is not enough to regard comments like the ones that I just quoted, directed at feminist gaming critics Anita Sarkeesian and Catherine Hache, respectively, as simply a slight variation on the theme of patriarchy. Rather, there is something distinct about the social structure of online culture and the architecture of the sites that we use every day and take for granted that lends not only strength, but also a moral imprimatur to this kind of behavior. The virtual realm of gaming and the internet more widely refracts as well as reflects the social structure of the physical world. There is a unique Mobius strip of reality and unreality in gaming culture. A Mobius strip is a mathematical object with one side but gives the illusion of having two. And the internet presents a similar illusion between reality and unreality a two-sided yet one-sided system of norms and values based on the conceit that the internet is real when it's convenient and unreal when it's not. For gamers, this is the distinction between they're taking our games away when it's convenient, espying a real threat to their world, their male-dominated space, and it's just the internet, why are you making such a big deal out of it when it's not convenient for them to accept the consequences of their actions? And I argue that we need to stop allowing this dyadic thinking to short circuit the necessary mechanisms of accountability that can passively encourage good behavior in any social space. 
In response, I have set forth a theory that explains the moral universe of both gaming and internet culture more widely based on the foregoing. My working definition of morality will regard moral choices as being any decision that depends on choosing between values based on the definitions outlined by sociology of ethics scholar Maria Osowska in her speech to the University of Pennsylvania in 1970. One set of values, as we will see, conceives of gaming as a less than real shelter from the demands of modern culture, including so-called political correctness, while another deems it important that people of all backgrounds be able to participate in the online world without fear or favor. In considering virtual reality, then, we must shift our emphasis to the term reality. We are confronted not with a pure simulation, on the internet, but a consequential social world whose vistas are expanding moment to moment, and where such moral choices have consequences for us all. This virulent swarm of harassment that I've been describing, which extends up to physical world interactions, revealing personal information online, sending unwanted correspondence to one's home address, and even calling the police with false reports that prompt a SWAT team to break down your door, it is the patriarchal id, a collection of gender inequities impulses unrestrained by the already vanishingly thin fetters of politesse that prevail in the physical world. It is the very novelty of the virtual space, a new social space akin to the advent of the agora, or the university, or the factory, which represents an innovation in human social organization demanding new norms and values. All of this occasions the moral choices that I have detailed above. Put one way, we do not yet know how to act online, much less know how to be citizens or how to be ethical on the internet. The guideposts that exist in the physical world are of little use to us there, and to whatever extent they may be of use, we think that they don't apply because the internet is seen as unreal. This conflict between values exists in gaming and in the wider internet, where any values that regard women as equal participants are often destined to lose, in part because this culture is fully continuous with that which has prevailed in the physical world. This culture provides space for a disaffected young man, in particular to more easily, as philosopher Martha Nussbaum argues, aggressively respond to women he perceives as powerful and aloof in order to, quote, dominate and punish them, remaining utterly secure in his own self. There is, as I am arguing, a particular belief that prevails online that makes that choice considerably easier for male internet users, obviating normative ethics that would disdain harassment. We all share in a popular cultural belief that the internet is less real. We see it in the, the metacommunicative assertions that we make all the time, whether in internet acronyms or in talking about it in person when we describe offline activity as IRL or in real life, we are, in our own small way, reinscribing this conceit and reifying it, suggesting that what happens online exists in this liminal space between reality and falsehood, between acting and truly, sincerely doing. That vernacular distinction discursively crystallizes an understanding of the internet that is utterly toxic. And this, in gaming spaces, that distinction is manifested as a difference between play and non-play. Child psychologist Brian Vandenberg argued in 1998 in his analysis of children at play in the physical world that, quote, the ease with which the real can be rendered not real by the simple signal, this is play, reveals the contingency and fluidity of the social construction of reality. I contend that the same is true of online gaming spaces and the internet more widely, and this exposes a crucial dynamic that, in the words of anthropologist Bonnie Nardi, render antisocial behavior unaccountable. Psychologist John Sula calls this idea that it's just a game or it's just the internet the dissociative imagination. Such, assertion, such assertions are often the first line of defense against someone who asserts that the behavior of certain individuals in the gaming space is disrespectful, offensive, 
or harmful in some other way. Nardi observed that behavior like asking a female gamer for naked pictures of herself would be glossed over as just a joke and made light of. This Mobius strip of seriousness and unseriousness, real social practice, averring, folding against the averring of unreality by the practitioners, is a distinct feature of the internet. It emerges from practices in the physical world, but in the virtual world, it substantively creates the gendering of the space in a more consistent manner because of how neatly it dovetails with the collective default assumption of play, which we all share, defying boundaries of race, gender, political affiliation, class, or even just the simple reason we happen to be using the internet. This gendering in the world of gaming, for instance, constructs male gamers as the insiders whose play can encompass harassment that polices the boundaries of the space while constructing women as invading outsiders. One is playing a video game or participating in an online community where games are the central topic of discussion. Therefore, the default state is one of play and thus unreality because it is seen as exceptional to the real world. What makes play play, what makes it what it is, what makes it fun and potentially generative is the shared conceit that actions taken within what has been called the magic circle of play are fundamentally inconsequential. On the internet, however, the circle has spilled its boundaries well outward into every precinct of social behavior and interaction on the internet where we treat all online interaction as an expression of ludic behavior, of gaming behavior. It then becomes easy to justify public behavior that would be considered rank and vulgar, even in the physical world of patriarchy. And what this is about is not saying that the harms perpetrated online are necessarily unique, but that the barrier for entry for perpetrating those harms is considerably lower online the cost to buy in is considerably lower. In, as I've often pointed out, in the real world, if you wanted to mob someone, see, look, even I did it myself right there, the real world. In the physical world, if you wanted to mob someone, you'd have to summon that mob and procure torches and pitchforks for the lot of them. It's a logistical matter. It takes a lot of energy. People have to take time out of their schedules. They have to leave home, and they have to be... In all, all, all seriousness, they have to be ginned up to a certain level before they will feel that it is morally permissible to lose themselves in a violent mob. It takes a great deal more effort. But on the internet, one person may simply sound a dog whistle, and others, while multitasking between a variety of other online interactions or physical world work, can engage in behavior that becomes like a mob, and that floods a person with vitriol, threats and makes them feel unsafe or unwelcome. The buy-in is much lower. You do not have to be terribly good at organizing in order to make something like this happen. And that really is the heart of the problem. And the lack of accountability that follows on from these behaviors makes it even easier. In the physical world, attacking someone does carry with it the risk that perhaps there will be someone who will stop you. You can't always rely on the much storied bystander effect. Maybe, depending on who it is you attack, of course, the police might intervene. But on the f online, that doesn't obtain. Not only because most people are aware of the lack of consequences, but because the behavior is so commonplace as to be seen as normal. And on top of that, because it is seen as the proper way to comport oneself in certain spaces. So if you think about online gaming culture, for instance, or the abusiveness in, say, Xbox Live, which is infamously nasty. What is it that players themselves think about their harassing and abusive behavior? The vast majority of them are not mustache twirlers who will say openly that they hate women or hate minorities, even if they themselves carry around the subconscious prejudice that afflicts so many of us. They'll say that they say what they say and do what they do in these games because that's what you do as a competitive multiplayer gamer. That insulting someone viciously because of their perceived race or gender, for example, or sexuality, 
is how you quote unquote trash talk. That the trash talk itself is an expression of play as surely as pulling the trigger of your Xbox controller. It's all part of the fun. And it, this is where I saw that conceit arise most keenly. The idea that the virtual is not real, therefore this type of behavior is acceptable under the rubric of play. In the wake of the public sexual harassment of Jennifer Bacosdi, a professional fighting game tournament player at a Street Fighter Tekken X tournament back in 2012 by her own coach. One man posting on, a fa on fan forums about that much publicized incident said that, quote, the fighting game scene is a chance for players to relax and be themselves away from an insane, politically correct culture, end quote. But no thought was given to Ms. Pekosdi's need to relax and be herself away from her own bugbears. What do other male gamers themselves think? We might consider the words of one young man who said to sociologist Michael Kimmel in researching his recent book, Guyland, we all know the PC drill, blah, 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 but come on, man. It's only a goddamn game. It's just entertainment. Or those of a YouTube commenter who wrote to Anita Sarkeesian, telling her to scrap her documentary project about gender in video games because, quote, it's just a game. Those girls depicted in the games aren't real, now are they? It's not real, therefore it's okay. This is the amoral substructure of internet culture. And this, far more than anonymity, is the source of much gender and racial harassment on the internet. Anonymity is, at worst, a lesser accelerant of prejudicial behavior. People can and do say belligerent or bigoted things online with their real names attached, and in the case of Facebook, even their photos. Rather, we must focus on the amorality of this social structure, and in particular, the lack of accountability that prevails online, where bad behavior is waved off or shrugged at as so much expected piffle. It is by now, as I suggested, a popular both academic and media canard to suggest that anonymity is the primary source of symbolic violence online. But this belief ignores ample empirical evidence available to even the casual internet user. Facebook is filled with millions of people, most of whom use their legal names and photos when they post things that may be considered antisocial, aggressive, prejudicial, or even harassing. On Huffington Post, there was a recent story about a young black woman who was viciously harassed by a man on Facebook for expressing her political opinion. He worked at an insurance firm, which she knew because that was right there in his Facebook profile next to his official photo and his legal name. And in spite of that, he still felt motivated to describe in graphic detail how he would rape her. Much like an online game's cresting tide of report backlogs, Facebook can barely keep up with the number of abuse reports about exactly this kind of behavior that it receives daily. Anonymity plays its role, but as John Sula documented, it is one of only several social mechanisms bearing on this question. The way in which we impute causality to anonymity is tantamount to throwing our hands up and saying that we can do nothing. While I would not entirely dismiss the role of anonymity, it has become so vastly overemphasized in popular discourse that it can lead to ham-handed non-solutions that exacerbate existing problems. For instance, Blizzard Entertainment's abortive real ID proposal would have made it impossible for players to be anonymous in its flagship online game World of Warcraft. Their legal names would have been revealed in both the live game every time they tried to chat or in the game's web forums where much needful social interaction takes place. The rationale for this was, unsurprisingly, to prevent harassment and bad behavior. The idea was that if one had to post hate speech under their legal name, they would be less likely to do so. The backlash against this proposal was swift and seemingly universal. But feminism reveals a very particular and oft unrecognized truth about situations like these. Anonymity is both an accelerant to abuse and a shield against it. 
Anonymity is part and parcel of what can make video gaming so enchanting, and the internet in general, that grand ballo and mascara that makes any online game what it is. To be someone else, someone new, is where much of the emancipatory potential of gaming lies, and we would do well not to squander it. Feminists and all progressives, who often express an interest in doing something about the problem of online harassment, must take note of this, and not be swayed by false protestations that we must shed our anonymity in the name of anyone's rights. The absconding of anonymity in the online gaming world would, after all, disadvantage private women, transgender women, women who do not wish to be found by stalkers or abusive exes, and so on, people hiding their legal identities from the police, from an oppressive regime, or sex workers who do not want their legal names to be published publicly for a variety of reasons that I should hope are obvious. If feminism is to create a solution, theoretically, academically, or through activism, it will not lie in removing a vital tool that gives marginalized voices in cyberspace a precious measure of control over their identities. New evidence even suggests that women in particular, in a statistically significant manner when compared to men, benefit from the cloak of anonymity and are more forthcoming about their lives when not personally identified. We might well be robbing women, and all internet users for that matter, of a capability that we cannot meaningfully consent to losing. In the process, we put the cart well before the horse and remove a resourceful innovation that many people use to mitigate or combat harassment while failing to get at the source of the abuse. Anonymity is not only a negative condition in the sense of hiding one's, quote, real or legal identity, but also a positive one. Anonymity contains the potential for reinvention and the beginnings of a new identity altogether, something it should surely be our right to decide whether or not we create. Here's where the seeds of freedom and perhaps even resistance might well germinate. Many scholars have rightly pointed out that internet use is increasingly vital for full participation in modern society, allowing a wider web of diverse interactions with diverse peoples one might not ordinarily be exposed to. Economic opportunities prevail as well, autodidactic opportunities, and ways of participating in the political process. The International Society for Technology Education, for instance, promotes what it calls the nine elements of a digital citizen, which mostly constellate around the ways in which internet use improves our physical world lives and around literacy with different online components like email, instant messaging, and so forth. The emphasis on how the internet makes us better citizens in the classical sense is important to remember going forward. They illustrate what would be lost if one were denied internet access as a result of their virtual vulnerability being exploited. But we also have to go beyond that definition. Being a digital citizen does not simply mean using the internet to research candidates that one is going to vote for in the forthcoming election, although certainly that is right and proper to do. There's much more about online citizenship that involves our actual behavior on the internet and our responsibilities towards one another, as well as the rights that we specifically have in the virtual space. But those benefits I touted earlier can be understood as belonging to a suite of, quote, capabilities, in the sense that philosopher Martha Nussbaum and economist Amartya Sen have used the term. This concept was deployed by Nussbaum and Sen as an alternative to economical statistical measures of development and shifted the focus onto what people in a given country were able to do and what opportunities they could reasonably avail themselves of in lieu of simply using gross domestic product as a measure of a nation's wealth and prosperity. Nussbaum developed a list of 10 central capabilities that delimit what one should be, quote, be able to do in order to be considered free. One should be able to live a full life, for instance, and be able to access health care, education, shelter, as well as being able to preserve one's bodily integrity from assault, rape, and other harms, or being able to have a choice in matters of sexuality and reproduction. This is about what people are able to do, not merely the collective wealth of a nation. 
What makes the capabilities approach interesting for our purposes is that it emphasizes positive freedoms and potentials rather than simply the absence of them and the absence of harm. For instance, Nussbaum articulates a capability to, quote, be able to use the senses, be able to imagine, to think, and to reason, and to do these things in a way informed and cultivated by an adequate education, adding that one should also be able to, quote, use imagination and thought in connection with experiencing and producing expressive works of one's own choice, religious, literary, musical, and so forth, end quote. Here is where we can join together an understanding of our vulnerability online to experiences like harassment and threats that metastasize from online threats to physical world realities, and also develop a link to existing ideas of digital citizenship by bringing together this understanding of virtual vulnerability and virtual capability. If we can understand the digital body or avatar as a vulnerable body, that is your digital representation or manifestation of self online, whether it is the picture of you that appears on Twitter or whatever avatar you use to represent yourself on a forum, or the fully rendered three-dimensional avatar of your playing character in a video game. These are digital bodies. And if we can understand these bodies as vulnerable, and understand antisocial behavior online as a real harm capable of diminishing one's ability to benefit from the internet or even forcing them off of it entirely, then combine this with the existing recognition of the internet's benefits and Martha Nussbaum's conception of a capability built around senses, imagination, and thought, we have a clear picture of what a digital citizenship based on the internet itself should entail a prescription against enacting harms that exploit vulnerability and reduce capability online. There are a number of real-world examples of this. Technologist Kathy Sierra, for instance, was so thoroughly vituperated by extensive cyber attacks that in spite of her profession depending on web access, she scrubbed her online presence and dramatically reduced her social media presence, closing down her once popular blog on educational game technologies creating passionate users. Another technologist, Adria Richards, had to similarly withdraw from her online presence after a vicious trolling campaign, which included racist abuse, harassment of her erstwhile company's clients, and sending her graphic photographs of murdered women with promises that she would be next. In recent months, Game developer Zoe Quinn has seen her creative capability dramatically impacted by the abuse she has received from online harassers. She fled her home in August of 2014 and has not returned as of this writing, mostly spending time dodging a private investigator hired by one of her harassers, rebutting accusations and keeping her family safe. At the risk of putting too fine a point on the matter, these are not ideal conditions under which she may freely express herself through the creation of ludic art. She has finally settled in a new home uh, after I wrote this, of course, but she's still dealing with the effluence of much of this abuse and the continued targeting of her. These examples illustrate the collision of vulnerability and capability, each informing the other. Online, we are all vulnerable by dint of our digital bodies and avatars to having our capabilities blunted by antisocial behavior. We cannot avail ourselves of the promise of internet usage if we are constantly being policed into reducing our online presence, forced to deal with the outflow of harassment, or even forced to stay away from the internet altogether. For many, social media is not simply an idle, chatty distraction, but an extension of their workplace, especially in technology-related fields. One can even make a connection to Nussbaum's affiliation capability, which promises, quote, being able to engage in various forms of social interaction. Ensuring the latter requires, she says, protecting institutions that constitute such forms of affiliation and also protecting the freedoms of assembly and political speech. 
it should not be controversial at this stage of online development to consider unfettered access to social media and other networking platforms online as just such an institution. There are other capabilities we can add as well, such as the ability to avail oneself of anonymity to construct one's own identity. As a number of scholars have pointed out, one's shedding of a legal identity, that is the data that appears on one's driver's license, say, is not merely the absence of an identity, but a fertile ground for the creation of more, as I said earlier. It is a place where identities may proliferate from. If you think about online gaming culture, you can see that there are many personalities there who operate under consistent names and identities, who become famous for their actions in that game, who become popular as a particular user, even if their legal name is unknown. And that online identity may fork well away from the limitations and aspects of their physical world identity. Among the many positive capabilities that Nussbaum spells out that can be translated into digital forms, we might also add uniquely internet-based capabilities like the capability to be anonymous and construct new identities online. And I'll now talk about what those capabilities would look like as a list that modifies Nussbaum's original. We have seen that a concept of digital citizenship even one that is consciously unmoored from existing notions of physical world-based citizenship is still influenced by our conceptions of the latter. The goal in creating a clear understanding of digital citizenship, particularly as a palliative to online abuse, should not be to see the virtual as merely an extension of the physical world, but a discrete realm all on its own, in equal dialectical tension with the physical world, rather than merely an adjunct to it. Thus, in using citizenship frameworks, the goal should be translation, reinterpreting our existing ideas of citizenship to take into account the unique topography of the virtual and making them responsive to the capabilities, pitfalls, and powers offered by this realm. I propose that we can begin using a list of central capabilities inspired directly by Nussbaum's, borrowing some of her language, translating some of her key capabilities, and adding new ones. First, life. Being able to live a flourishing life that involves the virtual, not being forbidden from using the internet or significant parts of it, or of having one's virtual life so reduced as to not be worth living. Two, bodily health. Being able to have good mental and physical well-being, not being subject to online behaviors that are likely to inflict trauma, including but not limited to depression, suicidal ideation, a desire to self-harm, post-traumatic stress disorder, etc. This also includes being able to not live in fear of these harms being inflicted. Avatar number three, avatar integrity. Being able to move about and explore the internet whilst being secure against violations of one's own vulnerability being able to present one's avatars without fear. So for example, presenting oneself as a female avatar without having to worry about being harassed or attacked. Four, senses, imagination, and thought. Being able to use the unique extension of one's senses provided by the internet, being able to imagine, to think, and to reason using online educational tools, organizing platforms, creative platforms, gaming spaces, forums, and more being able to use one's imagination to create works of expressive art in every medium, including evolving ones like digital art or video gaming without fear of harassment or silencing, being able to blog without fear for one's life or bodily integrity. Five, emotions. Being able to develop emotional attachments to people online and to be able to express a full range of emotions online, including anger, so as long as they do not conflict with the capabilities of another. Not to have one's emotional expression, development, or art stifled by fear or anxiety about harassment. And you start to see how these capabilities imbricate with one another. Six, affiliation. Being able to use online tools to engage in all forms of social interaction facilitated by social media platforms, instant messaging, email, video, and voice chat, online game chat programs, and more. To be able to feel afraid, unafraid to speak and present your identity without fear that it will be used against you or as a reason to exclude you from what otherwise appears to be a public platform. Seven, 
play. Being able to participate in the evolving media of play and entertainment that the digital world provides us with. Being able to participate in comment sections of digital media like YouTube or Vimeo without fear of one's vulnerability being exploited or having discussion violently effaced by antisocial behavior. Eight, anonymity and self-construction, as discussed earlier. Nine, control over one's environment. Being able to choose who you interact with on the internet meaningfully and being able to block aggressive users without fear of reprisal, being able to appeal to online governance structures such as the administration of social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter without fear of compromising one's own identity, being able to participate in space, spaces where moderation is permissible, proactive, and not viewed as an intrusion, and where content moderation is seen as essential to the construction of online spaces where individual users are capable of controlling their experience, in other words. 10, web presence, that one be able to construct and maintain a presence on the web, not only in the form of one's avatar or online identities, but in the form of a website, fan page, blog, or other platform. Crucial to all these capabilities is the understanding that they must be cultivated and that their cultivation and defense is essential to the concept of citizenship I have outlined here. And also that like rights in general, they can conflict. And that one's right to an online presence should not conflict with another's right to an online presence. The ability to speak is contingent on the ability to exercise that right responsibly and ethically, for example. Throughout the list of central capabilities, I made reference to governance structures, that is, often as not the administrators of web spaces, such as the owners of Facebook, or Blizzard, the gaming studio that manages World of Warcraft. The notion that digital rights should come about organically, can be protected or reinforced solely through self-organization, or that a norm of normlessness permits these capabilities to flourish for all, is flatly contradicted by the widely divergent experiences of men and women online, or of people of color and white people online to give but two very large examples. Trust in a sort of cyber anarchy has not produced an online culture that is empathetic or respectful of online vulnerabilities and has instead allowed many toxic subcultures to grow in the vacuum, such as the, such as the auto-admit forums that Martha Nussbaum and lawyer Danielle Keats Citron famously studied where female law students were anonymously targeted by their male peers in vitriolic, often sexually charged ways. Or 4chan, the, which by the giggling I can tell many of you are familiar with, but for those who are not, is began life as an anime image sharing message board, but has since metastasized into being a hub of online harassment that is dominated by this anarchist ethos that I described. These subcultures specifically exploit people's vulnerability online as their central organizing principle. But there are ways in which one can productively combine online governance structures which assume a certain hierarchy and the anarchic crowdsourcing potential of online communities in order to create more productive spaces that allow us all to flourish. For example, Riot Games, the maker of the popular competitive game League of Legends, have started to become very proactive in trying to solve the problem of their own community's toxicity, which has become rather infamous. One solution was to create a digital democracy mechanism known as the tribunal to report disruptive users. The user would be reported with their offending messages submitted to the gamers themselves for deliberation. They could exonerate the player or vote that they should be punished. As a precaution, Riot ultimately had the final word on the matter. But as I wrote in another paper, despite the potential for abuse of such a system, the community rose to the occasion when actualized as moral agents. According to Riot, the judgments of the players coincided with developer judgments on bad behavior 80% of the time, suggesting ethical isomorphism between the well-intentioned designers and the average player. And when it came to the behaviors that were punished, players actually opted for harsher punishments than the developers would have in many cases. 
The social psychology team responsible for implementing this reform and others like it are guided by what they call the four pillars that outline their goals clearly. One, shield players from negative behavior. Two, remove or reform toxic players. Three, create a culture of sportsmanship. And four, reinforce positive behaviors. This rubric provides a good outline for the role of digital governance more widely, just substitute sportsmanship for whatever value a site needs to promote. Essential to all of this is the understanding that there must be an active role taken by those who administer and own online spaces, from a private blog whose owner permits comments, to a large platform with hundreds of thousands of users like Reddit, to a global and nearly ubiquitous one like Facebook, or an old news website. A hands-off approach will simply not work if one's goal is to create a productive community. Communities do not necessarily create themselves, and certainly the norms do not always come about automatically in a way that one may consider desirable. What always emerges from the vacuum, as we have seen on the internet, is an environment where people's rights are not taken seriously. And so, to conclude, the idea that the internet is not real, more than anything else, is the primary causal mechanism and accelerant to abuse on the internet. And it is why we have seen such an explosion of online harassment and threats. Even dissociation itself which historically has caused aggressive behavior, see, for instance, letters to the editor at newspapers, and there have been studies done of the fact that people can sometimes be very vituperative on things like CB radio. This was something that was studied in the 70s and the 80s. But the dissociative effect of the internet, along with the fact that so many of us are on it, and that so, mu so much of our lives now take place there, has ensured that that dissociative effect is something that we can all indulge in and something that is now essential to the structure of our lives. More than anything else, the belief that that dissociation should be caused to abuse is what leads us into the mire that we are currently in. And the idea promoted by some on the political left cyber anarchy portends a future of democracy where everyone has a voice and collective deliberation makes all the decisions is unfortunately an ideal that we will not realize unless we understand that we do not yet know how to be ethical on the internet and that this is a new social space. When we expect a self-organizing system to produce a series of democratic norms, we are kidding ourselves. And I cannot put it any more plainly than that. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
but it's a useful example of how online abuse bleeds out into the, into the physical world and creates physical world consequences. The reaction that South by Southwest had was, in one sense, not wrong. They were afraid, and they did take those threats seriously, as well they should have. We have seen time and time again what happens when a bomb threat is called in. The prudent response is to evacuate the target of the threat. One does not want to be the one who refused to do that and the one time that the bomb actually does go off. But what is happening now, facilitated by the ease with which such threats can be made anonymously, is that they are becoming considerably more common. Trolls have, to my knowledge, just this year, forced three commercial airliners to land because of bomb threats. One of them was targeted at a loathed member of the video gaming industry, in fact. Now, this is the reality that we live with. This is not something that we can simply say is just a game, that it's not real. It bleeds out into the physical world, and it has consequences. And one of the things that comes up again and again when I give this talk, or when I talk about curbing online harassment, is the accusation that I seek to police speech, that I am opposed to the rights spelled out in the First Amendment, and so forth. And not only is that not true, but the actuality of online harassment is that it is a bigger threat to free speech in the 21st century than anything else. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that South by Southwest uh, is a place that should bestow a God-given right on anyone to speak there. It is their conference, and at the end of the day, they have the right to decide who does and doesn't speak there. But I think there is an ethical question raised when threats of violence that come via online harassment can cause discussions in physical world spaces that are meant to host those discussions, particularly controversial and cutting-edge discussions, that they can be shut down by such threats. Now, I ask you, what is the greater threat to free speech in that scenario? What I was saying, or the fact that I cannot say it in that venue because of these threats? The simple truth of the matter is, is that in thinking about free speech as something that can only be attacked in legal and formal terms, we ignore the ways in which online harassment has presented an organized but informal threat to the speech of some. The fact that so many people, particularly women, queer people, and people of color in the gaming industry, myself included, have been viciously harassed for expressing our opinions, whether through the medium of op-eds, essays, uh, uh, video blogs, etc., or through making games, that's a threat to free speech. The fact that there is a price that we have to build into every public appearance we make, everything that we say in public. Every time I write something that's potentially controversial, I'm not only thinking about you know, the, whether or not I've written the piece well, although as my partner can tell you, I do fret about that endlessly, but I also have to think about the backlash. Will my family be safe? That's something that exacts a cost on one's ability to speak freely in a democracy. And so with that idea, now I open up the field to questions and I do apologize for the rant. Yes. So there are a lot of ways that I could answer that, certainly. Um, and to lay all of my cards on the table, when I was younger, I used to look at 4chan and their wiki site, Encyclopedia Dramatica, and think it was the funniest thing in the world. Uh, youth and inexperience can play into it. Uh, disaffection, certainly. I think that there's a lot of merit to a theory that I've cited again and again, which is uh, Eric Fromm's argument 
outlined in his 1945 book, Escape from Freedom. And the argument was, was that uh, you know, he was a, a social psychologist who had to flee the Nazis. And one of the questions that vexed him was, how did Nazism happen? Right? What were the unique conditions that led to it? And his argument was, was that modern life had produced a certain kind of disaffection in the masses where although there were theoretically greater freedoms than existed under, say, feudalism, what had also been lost was an overarching structure to one's life, what has been called a, a nomos, right? a structure of meaningful order that could be provided by, say, religion or norms or culture, etc. And that the modern individual was alone, lost in modern society, without a strong set of ideals to give their lives meaning and purpose. And that ultimately came about through people adhering to huge ideas that exploded onto the scene in the 20th century, which um, historian Eric Hobsbawm aptly called the age of extremes, communism, fascism, and so forth. Uh, that people who are listless, who are alone, this was also an idea that uh, Hannah Arendt identified in her own analysis of the development of totalitarianism and why it appealed to people. But there was a, a purpose that it gave them. It gave them a, a palliative for the fact that they felt directionless in a society that didn't seem to mean anything otherwise. And I think that there's a lot to be said for the fact that that's something that causes a lot of antisocial behavior that while it may not be anywhere near as extreme as Nazism, let's be honest, there are actual Nazis on 4chan. You know, there, there really are some very extreme political views that are expressed in places like that. And I think that while it would be mistaken to blame this all on 13-year-olds, that's a very popular thing to do, but it's not just youth and inexperience. There's uh, the fact that for many people who are sort of listless in modern society, who feel sort of lost in the crowd, these environments can give them a sense of purpose. Because when you look at what links together a lot of this behavior, 4chan, which also gave birth to the group Anonymous, which also gave birth to the group Gamergate, what links them together is this kind of nihilism and this sort of knowing cynicism about the world. What links them together more than anything else, more than any traditional left-right political ideology, is the belief that the world is fundamentally meaningless and you're a mug if you believe in something sincerely. And it feels good because then you can turn your back on society and think that you're rather clever for doing so, that you know something that the other guy doesn't that you have this inside line to the fundamental truth of the world. When you look at what 4chan is say, for instance, you know, they consider anyone that believes in something sincerely, regardless of what it is, they call them, quote, moral fags. The idea that if you, they even addressed Anonymous that way, because remember, Anonymous's distinction, and Gamergate's in its own way too, is that they ultimately did come to believe in something sincerely. Gamergate it was, you know, harassment of women, under the fig leaf of ethics and gaming journalism. And with Anonymous, it was a suite of left libertarian political causes. So in this world, that nihilism is an overarching theme. And I think that it actually draws people in because it provides them with a totalizing meaning system. And that has a comfort to it. it gives them a sense that they are in control. So given that, if there was a system to ensure that the citizens were allowed to participate in order to create this sense of responsibility, how would that, how would that be presented? Like, how do we weed out that basic behavior? Is that ethical? Should we prevent people who are, who may be going through a severe existential crisis about their own, as many college students not talking about me at all, um, <laughs> go through? Like, how, we, we do know in developing 
developmental theory, in developmental psychology, that there are stages that people reach in order to come to maturity and to be able to understand the complexities. Right. Should we not allow people who have reached that sort of mentality to have a place online? Well, you ask a very good question, by the way, and this is obviously an issue that has to be addressed very directly. I don't think that the behavior of four channels in and of itself constitutes a phase that we all go through, but at the same time, they have, they're, they're expressing a certain right to free association, and they're providing a kind of community for one another, right? And so yes, in that sense, for those people, in, an, in their own environment, that can be a positive for them. It does give them something. And so should it be our right to create that? Well, this is why I talked about the conflict between rights, because their, their organizing principle is to violate the rights of others, to exploit online vulnerability. That's specifically what they do, is in terms of looking for an ideal target for trolling, i.e. what they call a loud cow, someone that they can milk for laughs, they look for someone that is vulnerable on the internet, someone who's very passionate about something. Now, this can take, you know, mildly annoying forms, like for instance, going to a vegan forum and sharing hamburger recipes, for instance. That's a form of trolling. You're exploiting the fact that people in that forum are passionate about being vegan, so you know you annoy them with meat recipes, right? But there are also many more ways to exploit someone that do much greater uh, psychic and even ultimately physical harm, right? So like when I was harassed en masse by Gamergate, for instance, it did have a physical effect on me. Uh, I lost my appetite, I lost weight, uh, I could barely get out of bed, I had to uh, take Xanax. So, you know, as I often say, my, body, my bodily chemistry literally had to change because of what I had experienced online. Groups like 4chan and those inspired by that ethos and others who may be unaffiliated but also harass make it their mission to use the internet in ways that exploit people. And the rights that I have outlined explicitly exclude that as an acceptable form of behavior. I do think that one of the things that needs to happen in our educational system and I think with parents more widely is that we need to be more receptive to the online world as a place that we should teach children to be good members of rather than simply say, oh, only spend two hours a day online or don't do that at all. And I think that that's one of the solutions because I think that a lot of the listlessness that young people, particularly in these sites, feel has to do with the fact that they really can't go to anyone in the physical world, uh, their parents, their schools, etc., who actually understand what it is that they're getting out of the internet, right? And this is one of the, the challenges I have when I talk about online harassment because there are so many people who are like, oh yeah, the internet, that toxic place, yeah. And I don't want people to retreat because of the things that I say. That's the exact opposite of what I want. I want people to be more engaged with the internet as a space where we can teach one another to treat one another well. And so, yeah, I know that that's not the most satisfying answer, but I also have to take other questions. Uh, yes, sir, you in the back. You. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you to say more about the um, notion of genre or genres and subgenres as kind of a mediated presence, both between, kind of an essential mediated presence between both individual you know, agency and social reality on the one hand, and on the other hand, kind of uh, you know, the real world versus a fictional or virtual reality. Um, and I wanted to hear more about that, both in relation to kind of a diagnosis of um, your diagnosis of what's, you know, why these forms of speech are and threats are, you know, so prevalent online and different kinds of sorts of communities, but also in relation to what you propose as kind of a viable ethics and what you termed a kind of translation of real world ethical rights and values into a uh, online kind of dimension. So genre in what sense specifically? Because I know that, that that's a short term that can mean different things in different disciplines. I come from literature, so I, I'm thinking of kind of a Raymond Williams type sense of his kind of idea of genre as uh, you know, the mediating imaginative kind of form that um, bears upon.
on the individual in relation to society as well as imaginary forms in relation to reality. But so you know, that's just my that's just where I'm coming from in terms of my question and being able to talk. Absolutely. So there are a lot of ways that I could answer that. I do think that one of the most important things to bear in mind about the internet is that it is indeed an imaginative space and that so much of our interaction online is based on creating imaginaries through which we interact with the world. In sociology, uh, we talk more about the creation of schemas and the execution of what's known as a habitus. Now, a habitus is essentially the way in which one comports oneself and how it interacts with the way in which you see the world. So for instance, a boxer's habitus involves a certain type of physical regimen, a way of interpreting movement, a way of understanding their own body that cannot necessarily be replicated purely through rhetorical teaching. That you can only know the habitus by embodying it, by living it. A habitus is an embodied social self, in other words. So being online creates specific kinds of habitus. And antisocial behavior in that light is a means of executing it, where you are socialized to comport yourself in a certain way and to recognize certain actions as essential to the execution of the identity that you are cultivating on the internet. The way in which you imagine the world around you and the world that you are trying to live in as a member of a given community. So for instance, the imaginative world of 4chan, as I was discussing earlier, is a very nihilistic one. It's uh, one laden with, in some quarters, conspiracies, one in which these people are uh, noble exemplars uh, and avatars of the internet itself. And that worldview colors everything that they do, but the actions themselves are also part of the belief, if you like. So trolling as a 4 chan is an extension or an expression of one's habitus, right? And one of the reasons that we tend not to think in those terms, not only because that, that whole idea is very esoteric, but because we don't think of the internet as an embodied space. And we don't think of ourselves as embodied on the internet. We don't think of ourselves as connected to and through the internet other than in the most literal sense meant by your ISP, for instance. So changing that requires a series of ethical norms that recognizes your implication and involvement with the internet, that recognizes that you are a virtual person connected to the internet and the people that you are interacting with. Just as we perceive a kind of embodied connection when we are talking to someone in person in the physical world, we perceive the space around them. We perceive through the norms that we value that there are certain things that you should not do. If you're talking to someone, you out not suddenly sucker punch them, for instance. You know that there's a certain amount of space that our society considers personal space that you should probably not violate under certain conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have this embodied way of enacting and living our norms and the connection that we have with those we are socially interacting with. Right. It's why, you know, for the men in the room, why you don't stand at the urinal next to another man unless there's no other one available. Right. These are ways of embodying norms, embodying practice. So uh, I'm, I have a distinct feeling I didn't quite answer your question in the sense you intended it, but that's where my mind went after you asked it. So uh, I apologize if I didn't properly answer it. Uh, who's next? Um, what are some of the most successful methods that you've seen for um, countering this antisocial behavior or this harassment defense? I'm glad you asked. Well, there was one, that thing that I talked about from Riot, the tribunal, is certainly one very clear example of that. Uh, I think that that was very successful 
in engaging the community. As I have said so many times about it, if you treat people like citizens, they will act like citizens. And uh, one thing that I've also seen that works very well is so re-socializing people through holding them accountable. So for example, if you ban or suspend someone from an online platform, you do not merely do so, and certainly not just with a, f a form letter. You tell them what they did wrong, specifically, and the harm that it caused. So it's important to do the latter, to talk about exactly what they did and its harm. And that has actually reduced the, I guess, online game equivalent of recidivism, if you like, uh, where, where people actually are snapped out of the sense that they're in a magic circle and that their aggressive behavior is a form of play. They're snapped out of it and they realize, oh, I actually hurt someone. And for many people who are not committed harassers or trolls, that actually can be quite effective. There are also ways of designing games themselves to reduce the likelihood of sort of background radiation harassment. So in online games, for example, there are ways you can program them to make them more collaborative by default rather than competitive. Thank you for your question, by the way. Uh, and uh, Guild Wars 2 has done that in a very interesting way, for example. Uh, normally, this is a bit geeky, but when you play an online game, you what ends up happening is, is that if you face an enemy and you're not partied with another player nearby, if you attack that enemy, you tag it as yours, which means that once you defeat it, uh, all of the experience points and loot go to you. Guild Wars 2 has reprogrammed this system to allow players, even those not in your party, to benefit from that uh, loot and experience if they help you take down that enemy, right? So even if you're not partied with them, even if you've never spoken, as long as you help each other, you both get rewarded. That has actually decreased uh, sort of that static background nastiness because it's created a situation where these two stranger players are now potential collaborators rather than potential competitors, right? You're able to help each other, and now it's a good thing if some random player comes along and helps you rather than is constantly competing with you for the same enemies. So th those are little things that can be done in terms of uh, programming. It's ex this is exactly the sort of thing that I was going to talk about at South by Southwest, actually. So um, one more question. Uh, yes. Yes, and I in the fuller version of the in the fuller version of the paper from which the citizenship material is drawn, I actually do say that that's one of the distinctive things about the nature of the internet and why it can seem initially to defeat uh, classical ideas of citizenship. In the paper, I go through uh, sort of a long uh, literature review of how the concept of citizenship has been studied and deployed, particularly in sociology. Uh, and a lot of it is based on an idea of national membership. So citizenship historically is exclusionary. It's about defining who is not in or not part of a certain geographically bounded community in a lot of ways. And I argue that what makes online citizenship different is that in many ways it's the exact opposite. It is the elaboration of being cosmopolitan, that you are a citizen of the world. And 
In many ways, that's not strictly true for a variety of reasons because nations have tried to assert their national boundaries over the internet. So blocking certain sites, exercising uh, censorship, what is available in local languages and what isn't, etc. Uh, so obviously it's not a fully realized ideal, but the architecture of the internet contains that potential and it does sometimes reach that potential. So, and there are still divisions based on language and so forth. So uh, the, uh, the internet in French may be dramatically different from the internet in English because of which countries speak what language. So what political issues, for instance, bubble to the top might be very different from what you see in English language internet. Uh, so obviously that division also exists. But I do think that the internet as it stands is promoting a certain kind of cosmopolitanism. That means that digital citizenship is something that applies globally. You know, online harassment is a global problem. And I've read countless stories about particularly women uh, being harassed in a variety of countries. Uh, I remember reading one story on the BBC about how a, a politician in India was experiencing widespread online abuse for simply being herself. Uh, there, like there was no rhyme or reason to it. And it is a global problem. And the norms of, I guess you could say, the anarchic norms of normlessness, the idea that the internet is not real, that's an idea that has also flowed out through various global channels. I think that you, you could certainly argue that it began in the West, and it's become part of the conceit that everyone around the world approaches the internet with. And that's a problem. So I, the, I'm keenly aware of the fact that you know I'm of my subjectivity. I am a Latina trans woman from New York with a graduate, or getting a graduate education. I cannot speak for the entire world and I have to be somewhat modest in the prescriptions I make regarding online citizenship. Uh, there's a lot of privilege I have and a lot of experiences I don't. I do think, however, that whilst being as modest as possible, the proposals I have outlined provide some useful adumbrations of a concept of citizenship that can be applied globally. So it's a place to start. That was the idea for it, certainly. And thank you for talking with me about it tonight.